This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. We collaborated with the leaders in educational computing from research universities such as Stanford and Carnegie Mellon, liberal arts schools like Vassar and Reed, as well as state universities from California to Michigan to Maryland. We asked them not for their list of specifications, but for a list of their dreams. Not to extend what computers have been, but to imagine what they could be. Only then did we begin to develop the next computer. Hello cave dwellers and welcome to the cave for a very special two-part system review. It's all about this today, the Next Station Turbo Color. And you heard in the intro there how Steve Jobs was doing what Steve Jobs does best. He was promising us the world, telling us about a revolution he was creating and that we all needed to be a part of and part with our hard-earned cash to be a part of. Now, this is the computer that was made by a company called Next, or more accurately, a system, a synergy of hardware, design, software and programming tools. A uh, perfect storm, if you like, or at least that was the idea. It was described in its marketing as a university in a desktop, um, and it's directly influenced all of us, whether you've heard of Next or not. So join me then for part one today as we meet, explore, and learn about the history of the Next Station Turbo Color. In October 1988 at the War Memorial Opera House in San Francisco, California, Steve Jobs launched a computer in only the way Steve Jobs could. An invitation-only event in which he charged you a $100 registration fee to attend. It was at this event that he released the first Next computer. The combination of work by the Next company since it was set up in 1985, three years prior by Jobs, ex-Apple co-workers and trusted aides, such as long-term friend Avi Tavanian, the VP for Software Engineering at Next. Hi, I'm Steve Jobs, and I make computers. How many times have we all been in a great library and known there was knowledge there that we wanted to find, but there was no hope of our ever finding it amongst the mass of books? What if we could take that library and put it inside the computer and search through it in a second or two? We've done that in 1988. The next computer system was unveiled to journalists and the select elite in attendance. And what Jobs presented was a black box seemingly carved out of die-cast magnesium, which would go on to be nicknamed the Cube for obvious reasons. A multitasking Unix-derived operating system called Next Step to run on the system. An imaging model allowing the screen and the printer to produce high-resolution, accurate and unified outputs. What you see would truly be what you get with this system. He showed libraries and tools to provide an object-oriented and rapid programming environment. And most importantly, he described ease of use. The power of Unix made accessible to mere mortals was how he put it. And you, as a university, could own this package for a cool $6,500 US dollars, or around $14,000 in today's money, with your academic discount. If we can take what we do best, which is to find really great technology and pull it down to a price point that's affordable to people. If we can do the same thing for this type of computer, which is maybe 10 times as powerful as a personal computer, that we did for personal computers, then I think we can make a real difference in the way the learning experience happens in the next five years. And that's what we're trying to do. Now clearly at this price point it wasn't expecting to compete with traditional desktop PCs. This was to compete with Unix workstations, those by Sun Microsystems in particular or even to mitigate the need for mainframe based computing altogether. They aimed to put so much power into a single workstation that it could live up to Next's claim that it was a university in a desktop. This was all based on the approach that the software and applications of a computer will never exceed its lowest common denominator. So if you make the standard baseline hardware as astronomically powerful as possible, then it will get used to its full potential. From the processing power of a Motorola 68030 CPU and its custom complementary chips to its onboard 16-bit sound. At least, that was the theory. What you're about to hear is synthesized from pure mathematics and is created about a tenth of a second before you're going to be listening to it. 
This is from Johann Sebastian Bach's Concerto in A Minor. A professional musician was not included with the next computer. When asked what it was that Jobs wanted to accomplish with his black box, his reply came, I want some kid to cure cancer in his dorm in a room in Stamford. That was his vision for the university in a box, utilising the capacity to access a library of information freely and the power to process complex problems. When the dust settled on the grand reveal, the release was delayed by some months, but it made it out to universities in 1989 at their academic rate, before being made available to anyone else at a retail price of $9,999, or around US dollars in today's money. As you can imagine, with that price tag, this wasn't selling in large quantities. But Jobs seemed undeterred, predicting the peak for the first generation of next computers was going to be in 1994. Such was the time needed for what he considered to be a new and groundbreaking technology to mature fully. Now, I'm interested in the future, so I'd like to see what a few people had to say about it. I can walk over here, enter future into the computer, and find out that, uh, let's see what George Orwell had to say. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Not too positive. The second generation of Next Computers is where our system in the cave sits today. A new range was unveiled in 1990, with the original Next Computer upgraded and renamed to the Next Cube, and the new Next Station was nicknamed the Slab. The new machine included a faster Motorola 68040 processor, as we'll see inside, and in 1992 an even faster turbo variant was released, which is exactly what we have here. By now, Jobs had adjusted his sights. The slimmer but still very powerful system was gunning for what he called the professional workstation market. He now wasn't trying only to attract the engineering audience, who were comfortable using Unix on high-end Sun workstations, but he also wanted to persuade high-end desktop PC and Macintosh users to make the switch to Next for their desktop publishing, database or graphic design work. That then is some context of how this particular machine came into being and its intended purpose. I'm sure we'll learn a lot more as we explore it, so let's take a closer look at our example. So let's see then what secrets this black magic box hides and how much truth is behind the marketing hype. The next station colour, aka the slab, lives up to its name in both shape and weight, coming in at 6.3 kilograms or 14 pounds, monitor excluded. Next employees were banned from calling this a pizza box, as the same name was used by Sun and Apple for their form factors. Next branding of course takes centre stage on all components, including this mouse, which is more of a puck-shaped mouse than the original rectangular or tank-style mouse, with two buttons as standard. The keyboard and mouse are official, but defer to those in the marketing materials, so perhaps this is a later issue or an upgraded design. The keyboard, like other parts of the system, has a soft-touch plastic casing like that you might find on a car interior. A command button sits beneath the spacebar, and a control button where you might find the caps lock normally on a regular PC. The green power button on the keyboard is the only power button on the system, so without a next keyboard, you're going to have a bad time using this system. The keyboard and mouse surprisingly don't plug into the computer directly. The mouse plugs into the keyboard using either a left or right port, depending on your dominant hand, and then the cable is used to daisy chain the keyboard into this next sound box. And it plugs into a port with a symbol you might already be familiar with. If not, then let me give you a clue. Yes, it's the Apple Desktop Bus, designed by Steve Wozniak and first used by Apple in the Apple II GS in 1986. A non-ADB soundbox also exists, as earlier models used a different connection method. And this won't be the last similarity we find with Apple products. The soundbox you'll have noticed is a speaker itself, but also offers phono and headphone outputs, as well as a microphone input, and it connects to the computer with this Y cable. These ports were built into the original mono megapixel display monitor, but broken out in this soundbox in later models. The monitor is something of a beast even by CRT standards. It's a next megapixel 17 inch colour display, and you're probably wondering what that odd port is. This is a 13W3 port, and it's not proprietary to Next, it's also used on Sun Microsystems, 
SGI and IBM RISC workstations among others. They did however all use different pins for different signals, making them incompatible with one another. The next for example sends the sync signal on the same wire as the green signal, so you need a monitor which is sync on green compatible to do this, or further trickery to convert the signal into a usable one. While the monitor is next branded, the small print shows it was made in Italy by Philips and was manufactured in 1991. On then to the slab itself, which has been waiting patiently for our attention. Here she is, replete with those stunning lines, wrapping around the front and side of the case, and the next logo nestled in the front and centre there. A floppy disk drive hides on the right side of the case, and this is an ED or extended density 2.88 MB capacity drive. Double that of the most popular 1.44 MB double-sided high density disks of the same period. And those disks can also be used in this drive. It wasn't uncommon for wedge form factor computers to have a side mounted floppy drive, such as the Atari ST or Amiga 500, but the next station would more than likely be used in a computer lab with other machines, or perhaps in the corner of your office. And style has perhaps taken precedence over function here, as you can see. The rear ports though maintain both style and function. The back of a computer is not supposed to look this good. From left to right we have a SCSI 2 port for your external hard disk, scanner, CD-ROM drive or any number of SCSI peripherals. A and B serial ports comply to the RS-423 standard according to the manual and can also be used as a console port to view messages from the ROM as it turns on and perhaps troubleshoot the system. We'll also find inside a Motorola MC-56001 digital signal processor chip and the DSP port here hooks directly into that. We'll discuss that more when we look inside. We then have the all-important 13W3 port which connects to that speaker box where the keyboard and mouse are plugged in and then daisy-chained to the monitor. Then we have the printer port, next worked closely with Canon to release printers such as the N2000, a 400 dpi laser printer. This is a proprietary high-speed serial interface, and the power of the next was used to render the output using a software postscript renderer. Thus, printed documents had a true what-you-see-on-the-screen-is-what-you-get output, or WYSIWYG, in the case of the N2000 at a blistering 8 pages per minute. And finally, Jobs boasted that the Next was the first computer to have 10 base T twisted pair network ports out of the box, as well as the round BNC network port. Easy to use networking as standard was something Jobs considered a major selling point at the time, and indeed it was. Our eyes are then drawn to those fins, where the solid metal case becomes both form and function, a heatsink to the power supply. It's almost a shame that those long sleek fins are hidden on the underside of the case. Just look at those. A fan is hidden inside the case at the end of those fins, that's the green blob you can see, and that helps to dissipate the heat. Let's take a look inside before we see it in action. With a single screw removed, the case lifts right up as if servicing a car. Only if you afforded this car, you'd probably have staff to do that for you. You can see the solid metal finish to the case, and we recently learned that Acorn boasted their RISC PC had case plastics made out of the same material as Riot Shields. Well, if Next turned up with this, I think the Acorn Riot police would leave very quickly. Inside we see that single mainboard with the power supply on the right and its cooling fan mounted above those fins. So what's it made up of? The CPU on this turbo model is a Motorola 68040 clocked at 33 MHz. It's a combined CPU, floating point unit, memory management unit and 8KB of cache memory. Now this isn't a refurbishment video, but on checking the CPU, the thermal paste used to help conduct the heat from the chip to the heatsink is more than a little on the crusty side. So to help it along I gave it a clean with some IPA, and confirmed it is indeed a 68040 CPU as you can see, and then I applied a fresh dollop of thermal paste, a little more than a pea-sized amount as this CPGA179 package chip isn't small, and then I refitted the heatsink which I'd also cleaned and that should keep her nice and cool. Next, love to shout about their two VLSI or Very Large Scale Integration Chips, which work in parallel to the CPU. Those chips being a DSP or Digital Signal Processor and onboard networking capabilities. The DSP is a Motorola 56001, the same DSP found in the legendary Atari Falcon computer, 
and it handles CD quality sound, music, speech and tone detection, all without trouble in the CPU, at a speed of 25 MHz. Other Next Design chips on board include the peripheral controller, capable of running at 50 MB per second, and a turbo memory controller, supporting up to 128 MB of RAM. RAM which sits here, all four slots filled, and we'll see how much of that maximum 128 megs we have when we fire it up. A bit of suspense if you like, I know you'll enjoy that. Next uses a direct memory access or DMA architecture, which Next say is similar to that of a mainframe computer. In other words, the peripheral controller can access the memory directly to manage peripherals without troubling the CPU. A ROM chip sits here and is comprehensive in its output when booting up. As mentioned earlier, we can hook into a serial port and capture the system output in a headless fashion, which is very useful. Then there's the Brooktree BT463, a RAM DAC, that's video memory and a digital to analog converter, the analog being the video signal leaving the nearby monitor port. The chip was designed for very high-end applications such as medical imaging and includes the XMAP architecture licensed from Digital Equipment Corporation. This allows different windows on the screen to have different pixel depths, so an 8-bit colour window could sit atop a 24-bit true colour window with ease. A really cutting edge chip for the time. Then we have the disc which is a Seagate ST1480N with a 406 meg formatted capacity. All things considered then, it looks like we have a neatly laid out system which has some powerful off the shelf components and some next proprietary silicon. All of which allow the CPU to flex its muscles while performing their own functions in parallel to it. Is it well thought out and powerful? Absolutely. But is it revolutionary? Does it need the market to mature and understand it to get the most out of it, as Jobs said it would? And did it warrant the price tag? It's certainly debatable. And remember, this is a system, and that includes the software. So let's power her up and see if we're wowed by the combination of software and hardware here. Let's fire her up indeed, or at least we will in part two, because first, I need to convert the video output from this funky video cable to actually work with my um, capture system using that sync on green or by splitting out the sync on green signal so that I can actually capture it. And I also wanted to make sure that I dedicate an entire episode to its use rather than just tagging something on the end of this episode. I've only got this on loan so I want to make the most of it and give you the full picture. You may also have noticed that on the Next Step Academic bundle here, it says it's suitable for uh, Intel 486 and Pentium computers, as well as the Next computers. So if we can, I'd like to get this installed on a 486, and we can do a side-by-side -side comparison of how well it performs on a 486 compared to that Next Station original hardware. And of course, we need to explore the legacy of Next. This is the last computer by Next in name, but perhaps not in spirit, and there's a lot to talk about there. So before we go, let's ask Steve Jobs how he thinks episode two will go. Steve, what do you think? Imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Not too positive. Hmm. Well, he's not always right about everything, is he? Join me in part two, and I promise nobody's faces will get hurt. Take care. Retro Man Cave is made possible thanks to the generous patrons scrolling up your screen now. Check the link in the description if you'd like to join them, or if you'd like to visit the Retro Man Cave shop for retro mugs, posters and merchandise to support the channel. Thank you all for your support and for making Retro Man Cave possible.